the cloud. All right, everyone. Uh, we will be we will be covering head and spine injuries today. It's chapter thirty in your in your book. Um, so head and spine injuries lecture. We'll be talking about it. National EMS Education Standard Competencies. All right. So the nervous system is a complex network of nerve cells that enables all parts of the human to, or all parts of the body to function. So the nervous system, it includes your brain, your spinal cord, the peripheral uh, nervous system, which contains several billion nerve fibers that can carry information to and from all the parts of the body. Okay. Uh, because the nervous system is so vital, it is very well protected. So there are several terminologies that are related to head trauma. Uh, head traumas, it refers, it refers to both head injuries and traumatic brain injuries, or TBI. Head injury is traumatic injury to the head that may result in injury to the scalp, head, or skull, but not including the face. Not including the face. The term head injury and traumatic brain injury are frequently used interchangeably. A uh, traumatic brain injury is going to refer to an injury to the brain caused by an external force. So spinal cord injury, or SCI, uh, is one of the most devastating injuries uh, encountered by pre-hospital providers, okay? And TBI is a substantial cause of death and disability as well. All right, so anatomy and physiology review. The nervous system is divided into central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Uh, the central nervous system is composed of the brain and the spinal cord, okay? And the peripheral nervous system conducts sensory and motor impulses to and from the skin, muscles, and other, uh, other organs to the spinal, to the spinal cord. <clears throat> The brain is going to be the largest component of the central nervous system. And uh, voluntary activities are the actions uh, that we consciously perform, uh, whereas involuntary activities are the actions that are not under conscious control. That doesn't even look like a baseball player. That baseball he's holding. All right, continuing on. The scalp is composed of uh, multiple layers. The subcutaneous tissue contains the major vessels uh, supplying the scalp. Laceration or other compromise of the vessels can result in profuse hemorrhage. Scalp bleeds are, are very, they're bleeders. They're, lots of blood. Uh, you cannot underestimate the potential for blood loss from a scalp, a scalp hemorrhage because of that. All right, so the skull, the skull, uh, the skull has cranium and facial bones. All right, cranium bones are what protect the brain, uh, and then you have the facial bones, such as like the mandible, uh, is the only movable facial bone. Okay. It's connected to the cranium by the uh, temporo temporomandibular joint uh, in the front of each ear. So right here, okay? The cranium is occupied by about 80% 80, 80 brain tissue and 10% blood supply and 10% cerebral spinal fluid. And if you add that all together, it makes 
And I really just had to do that math in my head <laughs> to make sure. I'm telling you, these classes are killing me. Uh, so the brain connects to the spinal cord through a large opening at the base of the skull called the foramen magnum. We will talk about the foramen magnum and how that foramen magnum works into uh, different types of injuries that we have. So there are four major bones that make up the cranium. You got the occiput, which is the most uh, posterior portion. You have the, tempor the temples or the temporal regions. Okay. And then uh, it's they're the lateral portions of each side of the cranium right here. All right. And you have the parietal regions. Uh, between which are going to be between the temporal regions and the occiput and then the forehead is called the frontal frontal <clears throat> so the face is composed of 14 bones you got the maxillae uh, upper and non-movable jaw bones. You got cheekbones. They're called uh, zygomas. You got the mandible, which is the lower movable portion of the jaw. You got the orbit, which is the eye socket. And it's made up of the frontal bone of the cranium and two facial bones. And the nose mostly consists of flexible cartilage. All right, so the spine, the spine consists of 33 irregular bones or vertebra, vertebra. Uh, <coughs> they're, they're articulating to form the vertebral column. I can point it at it with my pencil over here, and you have no idea what I'm pointing at, but I keep doing it. Um, The vertebral column. This is not the best laser pointer. Okay. You have the vertebra, the vertebra are identified according to their location as your cervical, uh, thoracic, lumbar, and uh, or uh, sacral. Okay. I usually always make them. Oh, what did I do? I touched your computer. I don't know what I did. I think you just hit the uh, the unmute button. That was it. <laughs> Here, I got I've you. Done something. That's okay. Got All right. You. Thanks. Good to go. Sound like somebody. Sorry, was it's up. my aunt. <laughs> That's we were right. making dinner for my uncle. <laughs> I was going to say, sound like somebody was making dinner or something. It's his birthday. Oh, a happy birthday. Thanks. All right. So, um, Where am I at? So the vertebral body is made of bone that provides support and stability. And the spinal canal encases and protects the spinal cord. So the spinal canal. Okay. Vertebral body.
the inter the intervertebral disc uh, separate and cushion each vertebra. That's what those uh, blue discs are right here. Stress on the vertebral column may result in an injury to the spinal cord or uh, or nerve nerve root injury. So peripheral nerve injury is a nerve injury at the the peripheral level. Uh, the most the most prominent and the most easily palpable spinous uh, spinous process is at the twelfth. The tw or, I'm sorry, not the twelfth. Is at the seventh cervical vertebra uh, at the base of the neck. You can feel it right here at the base of the neck. All right, something always to remember. If you're talking about, you know, if somebody breaks their neck or anything else, what's the old saying? One through four, breathe no more. One, one through four, breathe no more. But I've had patients that have broken or cracked or uh, what have you, their spine at, at, you know, one through four and survive just fine. It's all about the impingement onto or into the spinal cord that becomes the issue. You can have cracks all the way through the spine, the, the, the spiny bone or the, the vertebra, but if it makes any type of intrusion into the, the spinal cord is whenever you start to have issues especially if you have an injury and the spinal cord or that, that whole area starts to swell. If it starts to swell, then it causes issues. Okay. Uh, the vertebral comment column can flex and extend pretty substantially. Flexion or extension beyond what the spine is capable of tolerating at any particular level may damage the structural ligaments in there, which as you know, cause problems. Like when people do, do scorpion, anybody knows what the scorpion maneuver is? Or when somebody falls and their head, the, their feet almost touch the back of their head, they land head first and their feet almost touch the back of their head, the scorpion, I think they call that. All right, central nervous system, the brain. So it contains billions of neurons or nerve cells that perform a variety of vital, fu uh, vital functions. It controls the body. It's the center of consciousness. Uh, the, major, the major regions are going to be the cerebrum, the uh, diencephalon, the brainstem, and the cerebellum. Uh, most metabolically active and uh, perfusion sensitive, sensitive organ at that. So. Uh, it is, it's not very, it doesn't tolerate uh, the lack of oxygen very well. And it is completely dependent on cerebral bl blood flow. So something that, you know, I, I found pretty interesting is that the whole brain is made up of neurons, like it says, and it works off of electricity and, and the blood and the oxygen and everything else. But it's, and this creates all of your thought, all of your processing, all of your consciousness. Uh, when, you, when you think of a, a circle, when you think of a circle, the brain doesn't make a circle. The brain doesn't have a picture that shows up. A neuro, the only thing that the brain does a singular, it does a singular action. It fires neutrons. That's all it does. And that firing of neutrons is what creates your entire consciousness from there. It's pretty amazing. That the simple action causes so much reaction. All right. So the cerebrum is responsible for higher functions. Um, <clears throat> it's divided into the right and left hemisp hemispheres. The cerebral cortex regulates voluntary skeletal movement and the uh, level of awareness, okay? 
each cerebral hemisphere is divided into anatomic areas called lobes. The frontal lobe is responsible for voluntary motor action and personality traits. The parietal lobe controls the somatic or uh, voluntary sensory and motor functions for the opposite side of the body, as well as memory and emotions. The occipital lobe is responsible for processing visual type information. And then the speech center is located in the temporal lobe. All right, so this, the cerebellum coordinates body movements. The brainstem controls virtually all functions that are, that are necessary for life and the best protected part of the central nervous system. Uh, it consists of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. The medulla oblongata. Um, connection, it connects the spinal cord to the remainder of the brain. So high in the brainstem is, the, is what we call the reticular activating system or the RAS, R-A-S, uh, which is responsible for maintenance of consciousness. The centers that control basic but very critical functions uh, are located in the lower part of the brainstem. And uh, the basal ganglia, has, a, has an important role in the coordination of motor movements and posture. The pons contains numerous important nerve fibers. Uh, the medulla serves as a conduction pathway for ascending and descending nerve tracts. The spinal cord transmits nerve impulses or signals between the brain and the rest of the body. So it's composed of nerve fibers extending from the brain's nerve cells. It represents the continuation of the central nervous system. And there's a term called cauda equina or equina, which would be C-A-U-D-A-E-Q-U-I-N-A. So that's going to be a collection of individual nerve roots. What we have here is the meninges. So the, the meninges are protective layers that surround and enfold the entire CNS. Uh, the outermost layer is a strong fat fibrous wrapping called the dura mater or dura mater. <laughs> the uh, dura mater covers, or dura, mat, dura mater, however you want to say it, uh, covers the entire brain folding in to form the tentorium. Okay. The meningeal arteries are located between the, the dura mater and the skull. You can see there. The second meningeal, uh, meningeal layer is a, it's going to be a delicate transparent membrane called the arachnoid. And then the third meningeal layer is the, the pia mater or the pia mater. Uh, it's a thin, translucent, highly vascular membrane. All right, the peripheral nervous system has 31 pairs of spinal nerves and 12 pairs of cranial nerves. The somatic nervous system, uh, it's the part of the nervous system that regulates or controls voluntary activities. Uh, the, the autonomic nervous system controls and functions many of the body's vital organs over which the brain has no voluntary control. 
Uh, the cranial nerves are going to pass through the openings in the skull and transmit sensations directly to and from the brain. So uh, it also, it's going to perform special functions in the head and face also. So the peripheral nerves conduct sensory impulses that the skin and, uh, sorry, I lost some space. From, that the skin and, and some of the other organs uh, to, or some of the other organs to the spinal cord. So the, the brachial plexus controls the arms and the, the lumbosacral plexus controls the legs. So brachial, like brachial, right? And then lumbo, lim, lumbo lower, it's like your, where your lower back's at, right? So some sensory nerves can carry information from the body to the brain uh, via the, sp the spinal cord. Motor nerves carry information from the CNS to the muscles. <clears throat> and then connecting nerves allow the cells on either end to exchange the message. So by connecting the sensory and motor nerves of the limbs, the connecting nerves and the spinal cord <clears throat> form a reflex arc. <clears throat> Moving on. <clears throat> oh, Haley Ann, since I saw you were here, um, Rob said they were still working on the uh. North Mississippi Medical Center Tupelo, have you heard anything from them or do you have a good POC that you could contact over there to get rides? I'll take that as a maybe. Oh, from their training department, from the hospital's training department or from the uh, ambulance training department, I'm guessing. Sounds like a winner. Okay. Kirk. Kirk Cameron. What's his name, Kirk Cameron? Kirk Chisholm, not to be confused with Chisholm. Awesome. Sounds great. That makes me feel so good. I'm going to skip right over the rest of this because we can all read. <clears throat> Sounds good. All right. So, a head injury is a traumatic insult to the head that that may result in injury to soft tissue, bony structures and, or the brain. Okay. Um, fatal injuries uh, invariably involve injury to the brain. We're only on slide 23, so we're, we're plenty good. Um, depending on the mechanism of injury or the MOI, uh, you got to be alert to the fact that the patient may have sustained additional trauma on that end, so always take a look at you know, what you can't see if that makes any sense. So there are two types of head injuries. You got closed head injuries, which is going to be the most common type, uh, usually associated with blunt trauma, may result in skull fractures, focal brain injuries, diffuse brain injuries.
All right. So uh, those type of injuries are all they can. Uh, they're often complicated. Uh, if you have issues with uh, increased intracranial pressure. All right, the next one you're going to have is your open head injuries. So the, the dura mater and the cranial contents are penetrated. Um, brain tissue is open to the environment, which is never a good thing. Gunshot wounds are the most common penetrating MOI and have a high mortality rate. Uh, for survivors, there's almost always substantial neurologic deficit and a decreased quality of life as well. So open and closed head injuries have essentially the same signs and symptoms. So following the injury, uh, any patient who exhibits, it, exhibits, exhibits uh, one or more of the signs and symptoms listed in there's a table 30-1 uh, in your book that should be evaluated. Uh, they, those people should be evaluated promptly in the emergency department. So scalp lacerations can be minor or very serious. Uh, even small lacs can, can quickly lead to significant blank, uh, uh, blood loss. So this blood loss, it could be severe enough to cause hypovolemic shock, particularly in children. It's what you got to look out for. So because the scalp lacerations are usually the result of direct blows to the head, they're often, they're off, they are often an indicator of deeper, more serious type of injuries as well. So just be on the lookout. All right. So the top one right here, what do we call that? What do we call this? Can anybody tell me? Raccoon eyes. Raccoon eyes. Awesome. And can anybody remember the name of this? Yep, battle signs. That's correct. Battle signs. So there's your different types of uh, skull fractures there. So with your, your linear, um, radiographs are going to be required to diagnose because there, there's often no physical signs. So if a scalp lack occurs in conjunction with a linear fracture, then there could be a pretty good risk of infection. So depressed or depressed skull fractures, it's going to be a high energy direct type trauma uh, to the head with some sort of blunt object. The 
the frontal and parietal regions of the skull are the most susceptible to injury for this. And uh, bony fragments, they may be driven into the brain resulting in injury. So the scalp may or may not be lacerated. Uh, and patients often present with neurologic signs. All right, basilar, basilar skull fractures. It's usually associated with uh, high energy trauma, uh, but usually occur following diffuse impact of the brain or of the head, sorry. So generally, uh, generally result from extension of a linear fracture to the base of the skull, and it can be difficult to diagnose uh, with CT scan. So some of the signs of a basilar skull fracture. I was about to hit on that. You're still in my thunder, Leanne. So Leanne is absolutely correct. So uh, some signs of this are going to, nope, don't be sorry. You, you're, you're on the money. You're on the ball. So uh, CSF uh, drainage from the ears uh, or the nose, something like that, mostly from the ears is where you're going to see that. Um, raccoon eyes are battle signs. Uh, their, absent, their absence in the field, it doesn't rule out a basilar skull fracture, though. Just means it's, it's held in or that something swole up and closed it off for the time being. Open, open skull fractures, um, very high mortality rate. And there's some uh, pictures there, different types of skull fractures. You got your linear, you got your depressed, basilar, and open. Sometimes these closed head injuries, your your issue is, and you know any type of uh, basilar in insult, you start to have the different types of reactions, such as some of your your blood pressure wackiness, breathing wackiness, things like that. Because where where are those parts of or those parts of the brain control what those those areas control whatever it controls could be what is injured. OK, so something with the basilar skull fractures or something with uh, when you start to get into the medulla and the pons and everything else being at the rear closest to the foramen magnum is that um, if you have some sort of brain injury or brain swelling, it starts to try to shove the brain into that for uh, that foramen magnum. OK, shove it in there. And then once it starts to do that and swell and shove that in there, that's when you start seeing the issues. You start seeing the blood pressure, the pulse pressure, uh, the narrow pulse pressuring, the, you know, the combative, combativeness. And it's because it's not getting adequate oxygen. It's not perfusing like it should be. Uh, some other things, too, you start to see that swelling, depending on the where the swelling's at, it puts pressure on the ocular nerve. And whenever there's rear pressure on the ocular nerve, what do you think happens to the eyes? Other than pop out. We're not talking about that. More particularly the pupils. Yep, they start to dilate. That is why dilation occur, uh, occurs. Yeah, dilate or blow, yep. So that's why that occurs, because it, it loses, or it, that pressure put on the nerve or on, the, on, the, uh, on your eye, the, the rear region of your eye or the ocular nerve or what have you, um, it kinks it off or it stops the blood flow to it or it stops the perfusing of, that, uh, of your eye. And at that point, your, di your, your uh, pupils dilate. That's what causes that. Pathophys. All right, so TBI or traumatic brain injuries, 
classified into two broad categories. You have the primary direct injury and then the secondary indirect injury. Uh, the primary brain injury is the brain and its associated structures that results in instantaneous uh, that that results instantaneously from the impact to the head. Okay, you got secondary brain injuries, which results in the uh, in the seculae, what it says here, the seculae of the primary brain injury, including these the list shown here. So secondary brain injury, it can occur anywhere from a few minutes to several days following the initial injury itself. I'm gonna have to make me a coffee. I can tell a nap. Woke up too early. see if it works send a text message to my loving wife to see if she would make me a large coffee Let's see if it works i put a heart and a smiley face on it so maybe it'll work So the brain, it can be injured directly by penetrating object uh, as a result of external forces, okay? And the motor, the motor vehicle crash is the most common cause of brain injury, all right? So the, the injured brain swells initially, uh, and this causes cerebral vasodilation. Pathophys is so long. What was that? All right. So the biggest thing to get out of here is uh, the Cushing's triad. Cushing's triad. Remember, we touched on that a little bit uh, before. If she just put old coffee in a cup, and put it in the microwave. I just heard the microwave crank up. <laughs> I will not complain. I will just go on break and make my own coffee. All right, there's something I want to look up first. Before we get in, it didn't really explain it. I didn't think well enough about Cushing's triad. Who knows? Who knows Cushing's triad? Who can uh, put it in here and, and show us, or tell, like uh, in the chat, who remembers the triad? or Cushing's reflex. Does anybody remember? Who 
low heart rate, irregular respiratory rate, and widened pulse pressure. Okay. So a good way to remember that, the Cushing's triad, is just hypertension, bradycardia, and uh, bradyipnea. Brady, Brady Ipnea. So slow breathing, um, fast heart rate, and hypertension, um, high blood pressure. So the, pneum the mnemonic for it, or you could, the, an easy way to remember it is going to be uh, Cushing's triad mnemonic, be hyper Brady Brady. Hyper Brady Brady. You are very welcome. See if I can throw this in there. Holy cow, this is so small. Actually, let's do this instead. Go back one. That's, you know what, I was going to type it out, but I'm using a mouse, and this is a little silly. <laughs> so, I'm not going to get too deep into that, even though I really want to. Uh, it, the biggest thing is, is don't confuse it with Beck's triad, if y'all remember that, Okay. So uh, one way to remember, uh, one way to remember it is going to be uh, first off to find my eraser. All right. Secondly, is the hyper Brady Brady portion. That's what's really going to make the big difference on that. All right. I could have got into it. I've got to get me a uh, the drawing pad. That would be so much better. So uh, something else to look for is your positioning. So you have the two different types of positions. You got the decorticate um, or deseparate. So you got to closely injure or you closely injure. You got to closely monitor the head injured patients uh, for signs and symptoms of increased ICP. Early signs and symptoms uh, are going to include vomiting, uh, often without nausea, and headache or an altered uh, level of consciousness and seizures. Later signs are going to be your hypertension, your bradycardia, uh, the Cushing's triad, plus a unilaterally unequal non-reactive pupil. Unilaterally unequal and non-reactive pupil. Uh, you'll also have coma and posturing, which you see here. In the posturing, you have decorticate or flexor, uh, which is posturing, it's, it's characterized by flexion of the arms 
an extension of the legs. So flexion of the arms, arms, and then extension of the legs. Deseberate um, is extensor, extending. Celebrate, separate. Right? A lot of times, or they'll be out beside them, but it's extension. Or so, like you're celebrating, you you extend your arms and you celebrate. Uh, Posturing is characterized by extension of the arms and the legs. Some other things you may have too is a focal brain injury. It's going to be a, a specific grossly observable brain injury. So it's, one of them is going to be a cerebral contusion. So it's brain tissue is bruised and damaged in a specific area. Uh, yes, it can. Sure can. So cerebral contusion is going to be different than a contusion. Uh, I'm sorry. Cerebral contusion is going to be different than a concussion uh, because it involves physical damage to the brain. The area of the brain most commonly affected by cerebral contusion is going to be the frontal lobe. Uh, swelling will occur, and it might result in increased uh, ICP. Next one you have is an epidural hematoma. So it's an accumulation of blood between the skull and the and the dura mater. And it nearly always is the it's nearly always the result of a blow to the head that produces a linear fracture of the thin temporal bone. Uh, the middle meningeal artery is susceptible to disruption when the temporal bone is fractured. So in such, in such a case, brisk arterial bleeding into the epidural space is going to result in rapidly progressing symptoms right, to look out for. Uh, in the classic presentation, the patient loses consciousness immediately following the injury. Classic. All right, subdural hematoma is going to be an accumulation of blood beneath the dura mater uh, or the dura mater, but outside the brain. It's most common intracranial hemorrhage um, and may or may not be associated with skull fracture. Uh, bleeding within the subdural space typically results from rupture of the veins and the bridge cerebral con uh, cortex in the dura. A, uh, a subdural hematoma is associated with venous bleeding. And the patient often experiences a fluctuating level of consciousness, uh, focal neurologic signs, or slurred speech. It's uh, going to be classified as acute, subacute, or chronic. All right, intracerebral hematoma, it involves bleeding within the brain tissue itself. So it can occur following a penetrating injury to the head or because of rapid deceleration forces. <clears throat> Many small, deep intracerebral hemorrhages uh, are associated with other brain injuries. Once, once symptoms appear, the patient's condition often deteriorates pretty quickly. Um, it does have a high mortality rate, even if the hematoma is surgically evacuated. You also have what's called a subarachnoid uh, hemorrhage. And that's the bleeding occurs into the subarachnoid space. There's not a picture of it here. Uh, nope. So that's where, uh, so the subarachnoid space is where CSF circulates. The common causes are going to include trauma, rupture of an aneurysm, uh, 
arteriovenous malformations. Um, the patient typically presents with a sudden severe headache. And then uh, as bleeding increases, the patient experiences signs and symptoms of increased ICP. So a sudden severe subarachnoid hem hematoma, it usually results in death. And uh, people who survive it uh, often have permanent neurologic impairment. All right, so diffuse brain injuries. A diffuse brain injury is going to be an injury that affects the entire brain. A cerebral concussion, a concussion is going to be a blow to the head or face that may result uh, or that may cause a cerebral concussion of the brain if the brain is jarred around in the skull. It's usually caused by rapid acceleration or deceleration forces. Remember what we called that, the coup, contra, the coup counter coup? Okay. Um, concussions are mild TBIs and uh, results in the cerebral dysfunction that usually re resolve spontaneously and rapidly without a uh, demonstrable brain injury or uh, brain damage or permanent neurological impairment. All right, let's take a break. How about that? So I can go get me something to drink. Grammarly Business is an AI-powered writing assistant, enabling teams around the world. All right, let's take a 10-minute break. I'll see y'all in a little bit.
Hey, Chase, my cousin wants to say hey to you. You're on mute. Hello. Hey. Hey. You watch this class. Hey. I'm watching the class. Huh? You're watching the class? Mm -hmm. Great. <laughs> if I can figure out how to work everything in it, it'd be a lot better. Right, let's see here. I am always on mute. Every time I come back, somebody's got, just about every time, somebody's got to tell me that I'm on mute. You'd figure I learn, but uh, after repetitiously, you know, somebody telling me that I'm on mute, but I also repetitiously leave it on mute and then somebody tells me. So since there is no actual punishment for having the mute on, then I don't learn anything. It's not a habit because there's no there's no return <laughs> that's no that's unnecessary the the whipping yes i do not like them I'm a fireman. Uh, so we, we, yeah, I saw that thing you put out. So I have a, I, we had this cookout here last year. It's great. It's always good to have fans, but uh, so we had I had this deal I had this deal a long while back um, where we you know we invited friends over it's, and I say it's a deal because it's it's very rare that um, my wife and I have friends that come over and do anything. Um, she has friends. I don't really have friends. She has friends, and then um, I had friends that used to come over and we, or we had our couples friends, I guess what you call them, other couples that are friends with you and you come over and hang out. And uh, so it doesn't really happen that often. And when it does happen, it happens once, maybe twice. And then I offend somebody or, you know, something of that nature. Usually it's the wife, the, the wife gets offended. And then of course they don't come back over and hang out uh melinda has to go over there or or whatever because uh so anyway um i was like okay this time i'm gonna i'm gonna do well and uh, i'm not gonna pick on somebody uh or what have you because that's you know that's what we do we in emergency services no matter what you're in you you like to razz each other that's how we get along even if it's a stranger you still razz each other uh, in the class or you, you know you make fun of each other in some shape form or fashion you can show up in a classroom full of strangers and uh in uh, police you know in leo fire service and ems you can show up in a classroom of strangers and automatically uh just start dogging on somebody and we you know and that's that's my biggest thing is that somebody gets offended because most of her friends are not emergency services or anything like that related. Um, so anyway, so th these friends of hers, um, she's a CB wife and her husband's a CB. He's a tall, skinny guy. He's like, I'm talking about 
seven feet tall. This dude is tall, and I'm short. Uh, I'm five eight, so I'm not a tall person whatsoever. And uh, <clears throat> so, of course, I was like, automatically, this is this is going to be a good one. This this tall big dude. So, well, I I didn't think so, you know. And I have an affinity yet. He's he's a very good natured guy. You know, he's not he's not crazy or anything. He's from California. Uh, he's very you know subtle spoken or soft spoken he's not a he's not excitable or anything like that um and she's from she's from south carolina or which one is the outer bank that show the outer banks she knows the whole area that's a you know she says she tried to watch it but it's it's beyond her because they're they're our age i think they're actually a little bit older but uh Anyway, um, he, he's like a health nut. Um, he's, he's big into nutrition. He's actually taking nutrition as a, as college, you know, for college course, he wants to be a nutritionist, nutritionist. And, uh, she, my wife tells me, oh, he's a, he's a vegetarian. And she just kept going on about him being a vegetarian. And I was like, well, hell, I'm having a cookout. What am I supposed to do? And I have one of those grills. It's two separate grills. One's gas and one's charcoal. And I rarely ever use the gas. And most of the time, if I want, if you want to cook well, I use charcoal or I use wood. So anyway, um, I know this guy's coming over and I'm like, what do I do? We're having a barbecue and I've got to figure out what this guy's going to eat. So rather than my old self would have been like, he'll eat meat or he'll just bring his own crap, right? I went out and uh, cause I've had to do it before and do mushroom burgers. I was going to make a mushroom burger and I I've done it before and it turned out awesome. Uh, whenever I was a flight medic up in Jackson, um, we had a nurse that was a, was a vegan and, uh, we had a huge cookout. She was the only one that didn't want burger or steak or anything like that. She wanted a mushroom burger. So we use a portobello mushroom cap. And uh, I would actually, I'd marinate it in the same thing that I would marinate a steak in or, or that I would put in hamburger, I'd marinate it. And usually that consists of, you know, your, your Dales, your teriyaki, your, you know, I won't give away all my, all my secrets, my marinade secrets, uh, but it does involve beer and all that. So I marinate it in there and it tastes awesome. It actually tastes pretty damn close. You're never going to get close to meat, to real meat. But uh, it, it tastes pretty damn close. So uh, I grilled this thing up and uh, made the rest of us burgers because his wife will eat me. She, you know, she's like, the hell with that. I ain't doing all that. So uh, I made them up. I'm talking about they're, they're like this big around, these sun guns are. They're the same big around as, as the burgers are. And uh, they look really good. They smell really good. They taste really good. And I slapped them up there, boom, 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 put them on a plate. And hand it off to him. Said, "Here you go, here you go, weirdo. Here's your, uh, here's your mushroom burger." And he was like, "He was like, I got a question." He was like, "So why the mushroom burger?" And I said, "Because I don't know whatever the hell else could substitute as meat, you know, readily as as readily as I can get." And he was like, "Substitute as meat?" He said, uh, "I was like, yeah." I said, "Melinda said you were vegan." He was like, "No, no, I'm pescatarian." He said, "For the most part." He said, "I eat steaks and everything. I just..." more inclined to be pescatarian because it's a healthier it's a healthier meal he was like but hell no i'd eat one of them steaks if i had one or i'd eat one of them burgers if i had one i was like well i didn't get you one so you're gonna eat these mushrooms and you're gonna like it so and so i, I looked over my wife and i was like what what is your problem why so can we not get accurate information before we start start inviting people over Yeah. Yeah. With the, uh, air force, it's not really, you know, whatever you want to call it. But, uh, yes, no, I was not Intel. I absolutely was not Intel. So 
yeah, red meat, red meat does cause a lot of issues if you do have other, uh, if you do have other, and, and to be honest, red meat's not, it's not that great for your body in a lot of ways. It tastes really good. I, I like that. But uh, there's a lot of things that, you know, it, it does cause. Um, I did, I went the complete opposite direction um, last year, I think it was, and I went, I went on the, uh, keto diet, like straight up keto diet in my, you know, I was taking in, uh, less than 30 carbs a day, less than 30 carbs a day. It was nuts. I ate so much red meat and steak and eggs and everything. I got sick of it. And, uh, Hurricane Zeta came through and Hurricane Zeta came through. Um, of course the EOC, all they had was freaking hot dogs. And so that ruined my diet and I never got back on it after that. Once I got bumped out of ketosis. Yep. I did measure my ketones. I had everything like, uh, I did the, I did the finger sticks, you know, I checked, I checked all of that finger sticks, the pea sticks and everything else. Uh, I did all of that and it was doing very well. I had an app that did my macros, did all my macro stuff and everything. It was great, but I'm going to tell you, it, it hurt getting into it, getting off of it hurt even worse. All right. Enough of that. Enough of that. That was my mushroom burger story or my alternative to red meat story. How sustainable? My question is how sustainable it is. It is not. I do have, I do have a friend that he's pretty steady on it. Now he's not doing the 30, the 30 carb uh, diet or the 30 carb a day deal. Uh, but he does play, he does stay pretty steady on it. And it, this dude's built, he's built like a rock. I mean, he's, he don't have an ounce of fat on him. The guys, he's stacked. But, you know, that's just, he also, you know, works out and everything else. I'm a Mediterranean, now I want to get into the Mediterranean diet. That stuff's too high. Eating healthy is expensive. All right. Why, if I had a garden? I can't eat dairy. I'm lactose intolerant. So I can't eat dairy anyway. So uh, next up is diffuse axonal or axonal uh, injury. Yeah. Whew. So that's going to be associated uh, or similar to a concussion. I love eggs. I'll eat the mess out of eggs. Unlike a concussion, however, this, this more severe brain injury is often associated with a poor prognosis, right? So it, it involves the stretching, shearing, or the tearing of nerve fibers with uh, consequent ax, uh, axonal or axonal uh, damage. An axon is a long, slender extension of a neuron that conducts electrical impulses away from the uh, neuronal soma in the brain. So the results, the, it usually results most often from high-speed, rapid acceleration, deceleration forces is what's going to cause it or the most likely, uh, the severity and the prognosis of DAI uh, depends on the degree of damage that's been done. So this is also, it's classified as mild, moderate, or severe, your DAIs are, or diffuse axonal injuries.
All right, so spine injuries. <clears throat> so the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar portions of the spine can be injured in a variety of different ways. Uh, you have compression injuries that can result from a fall, regardless of whether the patient landed on his or her feet, uh, coccyx, or on top of the head. Uh, motor vehicle crashes or other types of trauma can overextend, flex, and rotate the spine as well. So mechanisms of injury, um, the vertebral fractures can occur with or without associated uh, SCI. Stable fractures pose less, uh, less risk to, spinal cord, to the spinal cord. Unstable injuries involve multiple columns of the spine. <clears throat> and without proper or without a pro proper appropriate treatment, uh, unstable injuries carry a higher risk of complicating SCI and progression of an injury. Some other things to cause concern, your flexion, uh, your flexion injuries result from a forward movement of the head, typically from rapid deceleration or direct blow to the occiput. So these forces can produce an unstable dislocation with or without an associated fracture. So patients can also experience a lateral bending. And then in flexion and extension, the, the patient's head moves from the front to the back and is overstretched on one side while being overcompressed on the opposite side. And then you have what's called a rotation with flexion. So injuries to the C1 and C2 uh, areas of the spine are considered unstable. And the rotation flexion injuries can often result from high acceleration forces from that. C1 and C2 on up there, right? So your vertical compressions, you can see there, herniations of the disc, things like that. Yep, picking up stretchers, stuff like that. So the compression forces can cause herniation of the disc. Uh, subsequent compression on the spinal cord and nerve roots and fragmentation into the canal. Um, so the primary SCI may occur when the vertebral body shatters and bone fragments embed in the cord. Uh, these kind of things can actually uh, cause a serious airway compromise as well. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. I, I remember, um, Heltai, you remember back when, yeah, I was about to say, when we, when we didn't have strikers with the, uh, with the motors on them, we had the, we had the old, uh, either you had the old infernos or you had the old strikers you had to lift up, uh, or you had the, uh, what was the metal one that we always talk crap about on the, uh, on the helicopter, that was what we used all the time. You remember what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, the backbreaker. So all it was was all, all it was. It had these metal deals. It was kind of like it was kind of like picking up a uh, an ironing board. You know how you can take an ironing board, pick it up, and hit the button. If you had someone and it'll, the legs will go boom and fall down. That's what this was. And sometimes. If you bumped, if you even bumped uh, the little handle on it, it would just completely collapse. So, yeah, it would kill your back. I don't know how we don't, you know, I don't know how ambulance companies could afford to hire people <laughs> with as many back injuries 
is what probably happened because of, because of those alone. Oh, neck injuries. So due to a hanging, and you can see there, And also depends on how they hung themselves. If they had a short drop or a long drop, or if they, they, you know, just leaned over on the rope or what have you, uh, can can depend or that can actually take what type of injuries they have. <laughs> That's funny. That two buttons. All right, spinal cord injuries continued. So remember, the ability to feel or move does not rule out the possibility of a spinal injury existing. OK, so obvious injury to the head, neck may indicate injury to the cervical spine. Uh, injuries of lower extremities may indicate associated injuries of the lumbar spine or the sacrum. Uh, injuries to the cervical area can limit the ability of the diaphragm to function fully and minimize the ability of the chest wall to fully expand. So one foot one through four, breathe no more. C one through four, breathe no more. So another sign of spinal injury is abdominal excursion. Okay. So spinal cord injury. It's going to occur at the moment of impact. Uh, penetrating trauma typically results in the transection of neural elements that are incapable of regeneration. Uh, hypoperfusion and ischemia may also result from this type of injury to the uh, spinal vasculature. Uh, spinal cord concussion is characterized by a temporary dysfunction that last from 24 to 48 hours. Uh, spinal cord contusion is caused by a fracture, a dislocation, or a direct trauma. A secondary spinal cord injury, uh, it's going to result from the primary uh, spinal cord injury progressing to further deterioration. So effects can be exacerbated by exposing neural elements to further uh, hypoxemia, hypoglycemia, and hypothermia can actually exacerbate the injury. So you should try to minimize uh, further injury through stabilization, neutral alignment, and spinal immobilization. Remember we talked about that many, many moons ago about immobilizing the, a patient. That's where you gotta fill the voids and everything. And then also if you, if you minimize heat loss, then, uh, and you maintain that oxygenation and, and perfusion, that's going to be the key to making things work. So spinal shock refers to the temporary local neurologic condition that occurs immediately after spinal trauma. Uh, the patient may present with uh, varied degrees of acute spinal injury. Sensory function below the level of injury will be impaired. Uh, spinal shock, it usually subsides in hours to weeks, uh, depending on the severity of the injury itself. All right, so neurogenic, neurogenic shock, it results from the temporary loss of uh, autonomic function. So hypotension, occurs because of uh, absent or impaired peripheral vas uh, vascular tone with the loss of alpha receptor stimulation. That's what you're losing. 
the adrenal gland loses its sympathetic uh, stimulation and does not produce epinephrine or norepinephrine. And then hypo uh, hypothermia and absence of sweating are seen in your neurogenic shocks. The classic case of neurogenic shock, shock is hypotensive bradycardic patient whose skin is warm, flushed, and dry below the level of the spinal lesion. Okay, so that's the classic case of neurogenic shock. Neurogenic shock. It's going to be hypotensive, bradycardic, and warm skin that's flushed and dry below the level of the spinal lesion. Cool beans. All right, spider webbing. So our scene size ups, you're gonna decide, you know, you're gonna determine the safety and consider the need for additional resources, right? You're going to decide whether the trauma system should be activated. Uh, consider the need for a paramedic backup if you need to. I don't. I don't see the brain matter. I do see. I do see uh, the blood matter. So increase your index of suspension and prompt search or, or and search for signs and symptoms in case of head injuries or TBIs. Uh, the decision to mobilize a patient is going to depend on your protocol, your local protocols, and not purely on MOI either. So the following risk mechanisms of injury strongly suggest the spinal injury and indicate this, the full spinal immobilization that should be considered. So full spinal immobilization, consider it when you have a high velocity crash greater than 40 miles an hour, where severe, where there's severe vehicle damage, uh, unrestrained occupant of moderate to high speed motor vehicle crash, uh, vehicular damage with compartmental intrusion, usually around 12 inches into the patient's seating space, a fall of an adult from a height greater than 20 feet, a fall of a child from a height greater than 10 feet, or a height two to three times the child's height, okay? Penetrating trauma near the spine, ejection from a moving vehicle, motorcycle crash greater than 20 miles an hour, uh, auto pedestrian or auto bicycle crash greater than 20 miles an hour, the death of an occupant in the same compartment, uh, rollover crash unrestrained, so mechanisms of uncertain risk for spinal injuries in, are going to include things like a moderate to, low, uh, moderate to low velocity motor vehicle crash, motor vehicle crash in which the patient has an isolated injury without positive assessment findings for a spinal injury, uh, isolated minor head injury without positive mechanism for spinal injury, uh, a syncopal event in which the patient has already was already seated in supine, a syncopal event in which the patient was assisted to a supine position by a bystander. So in your primary survey, you want to ensure that your manual stabilization of the cervical spine is in a neutral inline position. Uh, identify the level of consciousness protect your, and conduct your primary survey. Avoid moving the neck unnecessarily. Apply a C collar. Um, continue manual stabilization until you can determine spinal, spinal immobilization is not indicated. Uh, application of the C collar is considered a treatment intervention. Remember that in your uh, documentation, right? The cervical and thoracic spine must be in a neutral position. Can't, can't tell you that enough. 
Uh, focus on identifying uh, and threatening, I'm sorry, focus on identifying and managing life-threatening injuries. So always follow your uh, X, A, B, C, D, E's. So do your av poo scale while you're doing that. Confused or slurred speech, repetitive questioning or amnesia in responsive patients is a good indication of head injury. Uh, Reevaluate the patient, record your observations always. If the patient is found unresponsive, emergency responders, family members, bystanders um, may be helpful for information around there. So unresponsive patients with any type of trauma should be assumed to have a spinal injury. Don't forget that. Um, most jurisdictions are moving away from immobilizing patients based on MOI alone. So just make sure you know what your local protocols are. So airway management with a head or spine injury, you're going to clear the mouth and carefully but quickly suction it. That's how you're going to do that if it's necessary. Uh, after open the airway, you must be prepared to roll the patient to the side to prevent any type of aspiration. So manual, you're going to manually remove any large debris from the patient's mouth if it's safe to do so. Uh, use suction to clear any secretions. And then open the airway with the jaw thrust maneuver if the patient is unresponsive. So remember that an intact gag reflex is going to be contraindicated for an oral pharyngeal airway. And then a nasal pharyngeal airway should not be used if a basal or skull fracture is suspected or if there is nasal trauma, right? You want to be sure to monitor uh, the airway closely and have suctioning always available. You never know when they start aspirating or what have you. Um, So talking about ventilation in context of head or spine injuries, you can evaluate the patient's breathing, noting the rate, depth, and symmetry of uh, each respiration. You're constantly uh, going to ensure adequate oxygenation and ventilation in any patient with a head injury. Administer 100% oxygen by a non-rebreathing mask if the patient is breathing adequately. You want to ventilate the patient to maintain the ETCO2 ratings. And then under no circumstance should ETCO2 be allowed to ever drop below 25 millimeters of mercury, right? So ETCO2 should never be allowed to drop below 25. Booyah. Shaka. All right, circulation and volume resuscitation in a patient with high head or spine. If you got to do it, you got to do it. Go for it. So in supine patients, the head should be elevated 30 degrees. That, that maintains optimal blood flow and perfusion to the brain. 30 degrees, that's the magic number. So the type of history taken, same thing we always do. So chief complaint, OPQRST, sample history. Secondary, just like we always do. <clears throat> All right, so biggest thing, uh, you need to perform that baseline GCS and record the time and then obtain a the baseline GCS score and frequently reassess it constantly. 
So document all the scores and the times that they were obtained on the patient care report or your PCR. So pain or tenderness when you palpate the spinal area is certainly a warning sign of a spinal injury. So it's always recommended to get, it says you use monitoring devices, do the manual blood pressures and all that good stuff first. Do, um, don't be that guy. So be on the lookout for any abnormal posturing. Use a uh, the glucometer to assess blue, blood glucose levels as well. So in case you have an altered mental status and you can't really find any other type of injury, then you want to be sure, you know, use that uh, glucometer to see, to make sure that it's not a um, hypoglycemic. It, uh, hypo or hyper. Uh. It's not some sort of glycemic as your injury. We know them. Start that 18 gauge, give it to them, yo. GCS, GCS, GCS. SPO2 level above 94, right? What do we want for uh, hypoperfusion or for uh, hypovolemia or anything like that? When we're giving our IVs and we're maintaining. What blood pressure do we want to try to maintain? Does anybody remember what blood pressure are we trying to maintain? Above what? Generally, we'll go by systolic. Yep, above 90. Generally. Scalp lax. Dry sterile dressings, avulsions back down to the skin bed. If you if you need to, uh, don't apply excessive pressure to the wound. So do not move the head any further in cases of, and you can see the list there. Hey, hey. So always assess those PMS or that PMS after you do every any procedure, you want to assess it. All different types. Of backboards. And all of them are at uh, are at Alabama <laughs> or New Orleans. Mobile. Yeah. They're not much good for cleaning. All right, what do we call this? 
There we go. K E D. K E D. It definitely has its place. I've used it a couple times. It's definitely got its place. I've also used it on youngins. Yep. Works great for them youngins. We'll go over those. We'll go over those. I already know we're going to talk about that, taking helmets off and stuff like that. So you're going to remove the helmet if. All right, so let's talk about this. This is always a big question, removal of helmets. So some questions you're going to ask is, can the patient move within the helmet? If they can, that's not good. Uh, can the spine be immobilized in a neutral position with the helmet on? That's a question we're going to ask. So a helmet that fits, that fits well is going to prevent the patient's head from moving and should be left on, provided that there's no impending airway or breathing problems. If it does not interfere with assessment, and uh, treatment of airway and ventilation problems. Uh, you can properly immobilize the spine, which may uh, involve padding underneath the shoulders. And is there, if there's any chance that removing it will further the injury to the patient, you're not going to remove it. So you're going to remove the helmet if, if it's a full face helmet, uh, if it makes uh, assessing or managing airway problems difficult and removal of a face guard to improve airway access is not possible. Uh, it prevents you from properly immobilizing the spine. It allows excessive head movement. And if the patient's in cardiac arrest, you're going to take it off. So sports helmets. Typically open in the front and may not include an attached face mask. Uh, the mask can be removed simply by removing or cutting the straps that hold, hold it to the helmet. So motorcycle helmets often have a shield covering the face. If the shield cannot be removed, the helmet must be removed. So removing the helmet is going to be a two-person job. Uh, however, the technique, techniques for helmet removal depends on the actual type of helmet worn by that patient. So one of the one AMT is going to provide constant inline support uh, as the other moves. You and your partner should not move at the same time. Uh, you, should, you should first consult with med direction. So about your decision to remove the helmet. Remember, you don't need to remove the helmet if the airway is accessible, the head is snug inside, and the helmet can be secured to an immobilization device. And there's some pictures removing the helmet there. So there's an ill baby.
Back pain, one of the most common physical ailments. So upright posture, it's gonna place a substantial amount of weight on the lumbar spine. The more weight that you've gained, the more pressure is gonna be on that lumbar spine. <laughs> So tumors on the spine can cause uh, pathologic spine fractures. Degenerative disc disease is common. Yeah. Good one. Good one. Yeah, they always are. Oh, that was the last one. So as you can see there, pre-hospital management of lower back pain and the absence of trauma is primary palliative, palliative care. All right, and there's our four digit code. Let's try something new tonight. So do we have any questions about anything that we've covered tonight? As soon as I get off here, I got a history test. You open up the last day's quiz. I'll have to I'll have to look back at it. All right, so uh Now, why are you going to have, why, you can't wait? It, what are you talking about? You don't even do these quizzes until uh, right before anyway. Let, let me get off this recording. So our, uh, our word, our uh, four-digit code tonight is going to be 9684, 9684. So you can use for the, for the, the good stuff. All right, I'm going to stop recording.